Dr. Greenfield is, he received his MD and PhD from Yale Cornell, and he actually uh, completed his residency where he was a chief resident here as well. He's a board certified neurosurgeon specializing in pediatric neurosurgery, but he also treats adults. He directs the pediatric skull based surgery, epilepsy, epilepsy surgery, and spasticity surgery programs. He mainly operates in Chiari malformation, hydrocephalus, tethered cord, and tumor surgery, so in the brain and the spine. Um, and that's actually all I really had to talk about, so I would love it if you would come. <laughs> Let me make sure I'm still plugged in here. Before I start, um, did everyone have an opportunity to log into the website that's on your chairs there? We're trying to make this a little interactive. It's amazing that so many people came out on a Thursday night when it's beautiful outside. So we're trying to make this a little fun, keep you awake. Um, so if you have a chance to log into that website, you'll be able to take part in some polling that we're going to do during the presentation. So <clears throat> I'm going to introduce some of the other members of the department here in a second. The, the, the overriding emphasis on this um, is not a mystery to most of the people who are in this room who have Chiari or have a family member who has Chiari, have surgery or haven't had surgery. It doesn't really matter. I think you understand that there's a lot of confusion and a lot of um, disagreement among physicians about the proper way to treat this single entity, Chiari. And I think what I wanted to do when I started thinking about making a broader program at the hospital and the medical school that addressed Chiari was to think about this as a comprehensive condition that encompassed not just traditional Chiari, but really all of the affiliated and associated things that come with Chiari. Syringomyelia obviously is a big one, as you've heard already, but there are many, many more. And so we came up with this idea of Chiari care because it sort of, at its heart, has in its name what we try to be about here, the compassionate part of surgery, the listening part that Dr. Swedan was talking about. and learning from our patients and learning from each other um, is incorporated, but it's also a cute acronym for Chiari and related etiologies. So Chiari Care has become sort of the center, the driving force for what we're trying to do here. And tonight is meant to be an introduction to um, what we hope to build, what our current offerings are, and what our current thought processes are on how all these conditions are related. Um, I think if you go back to the CSF website at some point, take a look at all the amazing talks that are on there. I mean, they've really got essentially every person who has contributed something meaningful to the field to give a talk at some point over the last five years, and you can really learn a ton of information. So um, I'm honored even to be part of that growing list of people who are interested in this condition. I think this um, quote here maybe summarizes very nicely the entire topic. Ever since the postmortem description by Chiari in 1891 of the group of malformations that bears his name, it seems there have always been more questions on this subject than answers. And that's kind of a difficult thing for you guys to hear. You're here as patients and you're here as advocates for your family and you want answers and I think you all deserve answers and that's what we're trying to get. But I think as we've unraveled more and more layers of this Chiari question, this Chiari conundrum as the booklet says, um, I think we've been finding that there are, are um, more layers than we ever assumed. So we'll get through all that. In the, in the beginning, I just want to introduce um, the polling here, so get a sense of who's in our audience. Go to, the, go to that browser page there, and you'll see the first question. See if this works. If it fails, just let me know, and we'll just abandon it. So question number one. Go ahead. Have you heard of Chiari Care? No. <coughs> Where is it? They're not, they're not in the right order. I would go to our site. <coughs> go to your site. Jordan, get up here. Mal Cornell. Where is it? MalCornellBrainSpine.org. And then backslash. Kiari. Dash poll. Okay. Question one. 
Okay, yeah, we wanted to find out demographics. How far have you traveled to today's lecture series? There we go. And then where are the poll results going to pop up then? You should see it as, it, um, as people vote. It'll pop up here. Oh, there we go. So 77% of you from New York, 18% from a neighboring state, and five of you travel from even further. Question two, is, has everyone polled here? It's working OK? Yes. Do you have a diagnosis of Chiari malformation? Let's see who's in the audience here. Don't be shy, there's only 20 votes, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who you are, don't worry. There we go. I knew there's some family members here. And have you had surgery? So out of that 71% who have Chiari, who's undergone surgery for Chiari malformation? So that's good. So a lot of you here are trying to find out information about what we have on the horizon, to see how we can make this better and safer. And that's really what the Chiari Care is about. And um, after I introduce what Chiari Care is, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a couple of different topics. Real briefly go through a little bit of the history of Chiari for you, just so that everyone has a little sense of the tradition here that we're working off of and where we've come from. Um, some basics on Chiari, a little bit of just about the anatomy and the physiology to understand that. Some of the pathology that's associated with it, right? Some of these terms that you'll hear all night long, hydrocephalus, IIH, pseudotumor, syringomyelia, these are all terms that are um, part and parcel of the Chiari diagnosis. All these comorbidities, EDS, POTS, dysautonomia, cranial cervical instability. What's the cervical medullary compression syndrome? And introduce sort of a new way or a, a simpler way of thinking about um, lumping all of these related etiologies into a rubric that can make sense that will allow us then to think about how they're all similar but different and how the treatment may be different for each of them. And so that'll be at the very end. We're going to have a couple of those questions throughout the talk. I'm going to have a little break about halfway through for people to stand up, go to the bathroom, um, ask some questions. Um, please stop me if you feel like there's anything that's not clear. By all means, uh, I'm happy to answer questions as we go. So um, we got a brief introduction for me, but I just wanted to introduce a little bit more about myself here. I have a lot of similarities to this guy on the left there that I, my wife pointed out to me the other day when I was asking her who she was going to vote for. So both born in Brooklyn, track, live, vacation up in New England, the hair. Conflicts of interest obviously is a little bit more important for Bernie than for me. Um, and we're both lecturing to fairly impressive audiences here. So he has his own Ben and Jerry's ice cream and I, and I don't. but I. I, I it's hard to beat fish food for anyone here who's a fan, so. So, you know, the Chiari, let me just make this, uh, I think we're not in the, Chiari is not um, done on an individual basis, and that's really the heart of what Chiari Care is about. It's about this whole network of people that are involved in taking care of patients like yourself and your family members. Um, I'm certainly um, been blessed to have Jordan, who a lot of you know, start last year to help coordinate um, all of the programs that we're trying to roll out and trying to make as part of our um, Chiari Care Center. Um, but um, this wouldn't be possible without all these people on the list here. A couple of notable people, Phil Stieg at the top, my chairman, has been behind this 100% and has been um, very supportive of this initiative. Mark Swedan, who you already heard speak, who essentially taught me everything that I know about Chiari and has been gracious enough to let me know. Um, to let me go forward with this and to push it, um, as he said, to the next level and start incorporating some of these other diagnoses. All the nurses and physician assistants have been amazing. We're really fortunate that we finally uh, had a third attending join us, so Dr. Hoffman, who's over there in the corner, also takes care of both kids and adults. So we really have three people who are um, well-versed and well-qualified to take care of all the conditions that are associated. We all have our subspecialties as well, which um, are, are additive, um, but we won't get into that. And on the bottom, a lot of these faces, for those of you who had surgery here, you'll know. I mean, it's important to think about all of the associated conditions that um, are, require help um, if you have Chiari. And from um, skilled surgeons who have skill sets that are beyond ours, the, um, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Hartle, a lot of you know, Dr. Baj has done a lot of the spinal surgery with me. All the ophthalmologists, the neuropsychologists, our interventional neuroradiologists, they're all so important for us if we're going to really build the network here. One of the things that people say that they like a lot about Chiari Care is that we really 
coordinate amongst our physicians. We'll make a phone call if you need to get in to see our ophthalmologist that day. We'll get your MRI scan done that day. And so there are dozens of people on this, uh, on the list of Chiari care related physicians who aren't even on this slide. Um, so it goes without saying that it takes a lot of people. And in the upper right, Roseanne has been at the center of this as well. So kudos to Roseanne for organizing this evening along with the CSF and helping get Chiari care off the ground. So thank you, Roseanne. So why haven't we figured out Chiari yet? Is it too complex? Is it multiple diseases? Are there too many comorbidities? I think all these questions are valid, but I think it might be even simpler. I think, I think maybe we need some help here. Have we been overestimating the intelligence of brain surgeons? I think, I think you know, this obviously is tongue in cheek, but there, there is a lot more to Chiari care than surgery, right? I think surgery is the end result of all this. And so um, I think part of the difficulty in why Chiari care has, not Chiari care, our Chiari care, but care in general has been fragmented is because surgeons have really taken the interest in this disease for the most part. And it seems like a lot of other subspecialists haven't taken as much of an interest in it. And maybe surgeons aren't necessarily the right people to be driving this forward by themselves. Um, you know, we need to partner better with neurology and with pain management and with ophthalmology. We need our ENTs to understand what we're talking about and our sleep medicine physicians. So this is, you know, again, this joke is meant to sort of serve as a backdrop for why it is so important that we integrate all these people and make this part of a comprehensive care that we can offer to our patients. All right, back to the poll. Here we go. There we go. Have you heard of Chiari Care before today? Let's put it that way. So some of you are learning about it for the first time, which is great, and that's, that's the point of this again. <clears throat> um, and I think our goals and our um, outreach efforts through um, formation of the Chiari Care Network really dovetails beautifully with what CSF does. I mean, they've been doing this for a lot longer than we have now. Um, I think the concept of partnering um, and sharing data, um, reaching out to collaborative um, hospitals and physicians throughout the country and throughout the world is really what CSF is about. Um, they've hosted con conferences on multiple con uh, continents, just not in the United States. And the chapters that they've formed this year, just you know, as you heard from Dorothy, just five new chapters this year. So this is really a ground roots effort and a spreading of uh, awareness. Uh, and I think what's going to happen from this is infiltration through osmosis or through sheer Fort Bruce, uh, force brute strength to get awareness into the community, into the physicians who are taking care of the patients. So getting neurologists better educated and getting all those affiliated physicians. So we're really proud that CSF has uh, asked the ch to partner with us. And these are some of the things that we want to do. So education is obviously important. So our website is totally full of education. I, I recommend all you guys go there. Roseanne's done a ton of work and ha there's a lot of uh, great information on there. There's stories about our patients that give you a sense of what people have gone through to get the diagnosis, what surgery is like, how they've recovered. We've uh, initiated a second opinion program that some of you have heard about for patients who are not from the area who can actually um, write in, send us their films online, um, and get a written opinion um, so that they don't have to travel to New York. And this has been even more successful than we thought. These are the referrals that we've gotten just in the last six months or so. I think last September we started this program. So these are referrals from all over Europe and all over the United States. So clearly there's a need for this. Um, you know, we're not creating this out of nowhere. There's a void that we're trying to fill. Um, and so hopefully we do justice to, to that niche and to, to building forward what we want. And these are just you know, some things that we put together. Jordan and I were thinking, what are the things that Chiari Care stands for? You, know, you can go around this, and I can, I can speak for 10 or 15 minutes on each of these, from the research programs that we've initiated, the collaborative um, uh, ventures that we've uh, done with not only CSF, but with the um, data collaborative groups in Chiari Malformation, the Park Reeves Foundation, the first double-blind NIH-reviewed and funded trial looking at duroplasty versus non-duroplasty. We're involved in any possible way with all of the organizations that are out there and all the institutions that are studying Chiari. So that this is not about Cornell. It's not even in our name. It's about a collaborative effort with all the other institutions and, and organizations that are trying to figure out um, how to treat this better. And, and at the very middle of that, obviously, is collaborative care, right? This is about getting, be getting better care for our patients. 
All right, number five, here we go. I know there's more than 25 of you out there. Come on, guys, let's do it. All right, who's the first person to describe Chiari malformation? This may be a trick question, there's a hint. <laughs> may be a trick question. Seventy-three percent for Hans Chiari. Okay, you're going. You're not. You're not. You're not biting on my bluff there, are you? So it's really interesting. I'm going to give you the answer in a second. But um, it, Hans Chiari is actually, you know, at the beginning, but not the very beginning of this disease. But I thought when I was going back and looking at the historical context of this, it was quite interesting because Chiari really started out as a pathologic diagnosis. Right? If, if you think about what was going on in medicine in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s when Chiari lived, right? this is about post-mortem evaluation of brains of patients who had passed away. That's what pathology was. There was nothing about the clinical diagnosis. There was nothing about radiology, obviously. We were 100 years away from the first MRI. So it went to a clinical diagnosis only when you know, modern medicine really took off in the you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s, and neurosurgery became a field. Then when MRI got reintroduced in the 80s, the whole thing took off again, it came back to the radiographic diagnosis being part of um, how Chiari is um, defined. And then now I think we're realizing that you need a little bit of both, the clinical diagnosis with the radiographic support. The balance between those two things is really important. So Chiari is given credit for this diagnosis, but the truth is, is that you know, Chiari II was described in 1641 by this guy Nicolas Tulp, um, as well as in 1829 by this French guy Jean Cuvillier. I'm not going to go through all these here. But I think the first person that actually diagnosed this was not Chiari, but this guy Theodore Langens, um, who wrote this thesis called Regarding Cavity Creation in the Spinal Cord as a Consequence of Obstruction to Blood Flow. And he was the first one to actually postulate that a syrinx was a result of pathology at the frame and magnum. That was a decade before Chiari came up with his idea. And I think part of the um, ironic part about Chiari getting credit for this is that Chiari's original diagnosis of Chiari it turns out that it wasn't actually Chiari. It was actually herniation of the cerebellum from hydrocephalus. He later figured that out and figured out what real Chiari was, but his initial paper on Chiari was actually not Chiari. Um, and then in 1894, this other guy, Julius Arnold, who I put in there because a lot of people know of Chiari as the Chiari, the Arnold Chiari malformation, um, as was sort of described in the 1920s and 30s when they were trying to give joint credit to both of these people, um, really defines a little bit more of what a Chiari 1.5 is uh, when the entire fourth ventricle um, herniates down through the frame and magnum. So the definitions have changed. But what we refer to when we talk about all these pathology um, hasn't changed. And I think having a little bit of a, a basis for understanding what Chiari refers to is important. Um, you know, the pathology is all related to the anatomy, and right? everything is about anatomy here. And so the base of the skull in the front, the clivus, and the base of the skull in the back, the, the occipital bone or the suboccipital bone here form an opening, the frame and magnum. And everything is done in relation to the frame and magnum. That's how everything is measured and how everything is defined. And when the cerebellum, the lowest part of that, the tonsils, herniate down through this imaginary line called the frame and magnum, the opening at the base of the skull, that is when the Chiari-like syndrome or Chiari complex of diseases uh, comes into play. So these, this is the anatomical basis for what you'll be seeing. You'll see a lot of these MRIs during the talk today. So this is the back of the skull. This is the front of the skull, that triangular two pieces there. Draw a line between them, and you shouldn't have any of the cerebellum below them. And so all of this herniated tissue right here is that that's the herniated tissue that gets referred to and is debated hotly about um, in carrier malformation. You can't talk about Chiari without talking about the cerebral spinal fluid. That's what CSF stands for in the other CSF. Um, and the anatomy of the cerebrospinal fluid is very simple. It flows from one compartment to the next through the brain, out through the base of um, the frame and magnum, and then down through the subarachnoid space, the, the investment of tissues over the spinal cord in the brain. Um, and that's going to be very important when we talk about syringomyelia and the interaction and relation between Chiari and syringomyelia. I put this up here for historical reference only. I think the the 
classic description of all of the Chiari subtypes is a little bit outdated and probably all, not all that relevant to what we talk about. I think there's some interesting pieces here that are worth mentioning. Right, Chiari 1 is what almost everyone here in the room has. Some of you probably have Chiari 1.5, but almost no one probably has Chiari 2, 3, or 4. Chiari 2 is related to children with spina bifida, right? open neural tube de defects, and 3 or 4 are rarely seen in um, are almost non-compatible with life. So these are all kind of variations that have been described historically from pathologic points of view. But for the point of what we're talking about, and maybe new classification systems, it's really thinking about how to subdivide Chiari 1 and 1.5 down into the clinical diagnoses um, that we'll get to in the second half of the talk. All right, this is a Chiari 2. These babies have open neural tube defects. The spine is open, and as a result, the spine, um, the, the brain herniates down into the spinal canal. And these are poor children with the other types of Chiari. So Chiari 1, right? So this is kind of the, the basis here. And we can talk about and debate whether or not these definitions hold true today. And that's part of what this talk is about. But I think to have a basis for discussion, it should be, you know, we should all know what the sort of the information that is out there um, is and, and how most physicians um, view Chiari malformation type 1. This definition of, of 5 millimeters of herniation is the length of tissue that's below, again, that line between the front and the back of the skull. It's often related to a reduced volume of the posterior fossa. You remember I showed you what the contents of the posterior fossa are before. You can see here that this patient has a very steep, what we call tentorium, that's a thick membrane that can't move and a shallow skull. And so this space is actually smaller than it would be in the average patient. And as a result, the cerebellum has probably pushed down during development to herniate out and cause what looks like a Chiari malformation. But that may be a very, very different etiology than another patient who has more cerebellar tissue or different pathologic constraints in the posterior fossa. So you'll begin to see very quickly that this is not just one disease. There are a lot of things that occur at the base of the skull craniocervical junction anomalies. You'll hear about craniocervical instability if you learn about Chiari and, and read about it and look at some of these talks on the CSF website. There's some very simple um, and common deformities and some very unusual ones. A lot of you know about retroflexion of the odontoid. It's a um, poorly defined and mysterious entity that a lot of people have. It's rarely um, significant and symptomatic, but it generates a lot of controversy in terms of what the role of it is um, in symptomatology and, and how to fix it um, because it becomes quite difficult when that gets introduced into the mix. This is the odontoid bone here, by the way. It's also called C2, but I'll show some more pictures of that later. Whole question. See, it's keeping you awake. All right, do you know what the five millimeter rule is? Now, if you vote yes, I can call on you, so be careful. It's about two-thirds of you there. Well, the truth is, is that most people don't. I actually asked um, some people today if they knew where the five millimeter rule came from. Um, and it's a, little bit, um, it's a little bit of a vague definition. So the five millimeter rule actually was um, around before even MRI scans. And so defining when the five millimeter rule started, how far below the brain uh, below the frame and magnum the brain needs to be to qualify or be classified as a, as a Chiari. Started all the way back in 1963 as far as I can tell. There may be earlier papers, that's the earliest one that I could find. But this is before MRI scans and before CT scans. This is when myelography was used. That's when they would actually inject contrast material into your spinal canal, turn you upside down, and then take x-rays of your skull. That's how things were diagnosed. Brain tumors, aneurysms, and this is you know, 50 years ago. So this is how this was first diagnosed um, in live patients, right? So beyond now pathologic diagnosis, these are now living patients who have symptoms of Chiari malformation. And they found that in these patients who were getting these um, myelograms for what's called cervical myelopathy, so compression of the spinal cord, they found, incidentally, all these patients that had herniation of the uh, cerebellar tissue, but seemed to have free flow. And so they began noticing that there was a discrimination and a difference between some patients who were symptomatic and those who weren't based upon how low that herniation was. And over the next decade or so, these things started to become more um, common in the literature and in the lingo uh, of physicians who took care of these problems. Um, a decade later, O'Connor emphasized the need to establish the location of the tonsils, right? So how do we know what's abnormal and what's normal if we don't know, you know, in a large population of patients what's going on? 
Now, if you look in 2016 at population studies about Chiari malformation, like the University of Michigan and St. Louis and Washington, Washington University in St. Louis have amazing databases. I mean, they've studied 35,000 patients with MRI scans, right? Just imagine these are these are patients, these are studies with 15, 25, 50 patients, and now we have the ability to look at thousands and thousands of patients through these databases. So the amount of information we now have is, is enormous. Um, but this is sort of what we all stand on here, and so the idea that there's a difference in how symptomatic you would be based upon how much herniation you have. Um, is long-standing. But when MRIs came about, people wanted to define it even more. MRIs were an amazing advance in terms of understanding the pathology of what's going on inside the brain. This is really mid-80s. Again, this is not ancient history when MRIs became widely available. Um, and again, the same idea. You could find normal people and abnormal people um, who had symptoms or didn't have symptoms, but when you stratified them out and started to look for patterns, it became clear that if you had more than two or three millimeters of herniation, then you were likely to be symptomatic with what they called the Chiari syndrome, and that, what we'll talk about, what we call Chiari these days. Um, but this really brings up this Chiari conundrum right down here. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that the, the, the cartoon was called the Chiari conundrum, actually. That was just... Um, a coincidence, but this is really the thing that we talk about all the time that we see in the clinic. Huge asymptomatic herniations, normal kids with huge herniations walking around are fine. They fall, they get an MRI scan because they may have a concussion, they find this huge Chiari. What do you do with that? What do you do with someone who has terrible Chiari symptoms but a tiny herniation, right? So these are vastly different ends of the spectrum here, but they get treated the same way. And I think there's a lot of gray in between there. And this is where a lot of the initial confusion in terms of what to do and how to manage these patients was, um, was brought into the field. So this is mid-80s um, where we are. The way we diagnose and, and look at MRI um, data these days um, is even more sophisticated than it was, and I think it improves every year. Um, we can see live pulsations of the brain now. We can see the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain in amazing ways that we couldn't see before. But we look for simple things in the brain to make sure that the herniation or the tonsillar projection below the skull base is not being caused by something like hydrocephalus or a brain tumor or a big cyst. Again, we look at the flow of cerebrospinal fluid and the motion of the tonsils in real time. They're like little movie clips. Um, new sequences have been added all the time. We can look at um, the spine with a resolution that's incredible. We can see spinal nerve roots. We can see cranial nerves with clarity that we could never see before. Um, but that data often creates more confusion. And so just because we have more information doesn't necessarily that we have more answers. It just creates more questions. We typically will get full spines to look for things like syringomyelia and tethered cords, spinal dysraphisms, even occult. Um, dynamic imaging has become part of um, the language in Chiari these days, looking for instability at the skull base, dynamic x-rays, standing x-rays, dynamic meaning flexion and extension. We get fancy MRIs that look at the tracts in the brain called tractography to look at the strain and the stress on the brain stem in different positions. Um, so there are people all over the country who are, are studying the radiology of Chiari in amazing ways. Um, I think our goal and our, and our hope is that we can start integrating all that amazing data into clinical algorithms that make sense and, and make a difference in how we treat patients. This is what a Cine MRI looks like. We'll skip over that. Tons of details, if you get reports from us, um, through our DICOM system, you'll get a lot of these measurements. I think, don't think we have to spend a ton of time going over all these tonight, um, just because there's so much to go through. But um, we look for the amount of herniation. We look for the angulation of the skull. We look for how much pressure is being placed on the brain stem by the odontoid. Um, we know that there's a lot of variation in MRI scans. Some of it is variation based on the type of scan. Some of it is whether you're laying or standing. Some of it is how old you are. And there's definitely um, a metric that changes as you get older. I'll show you a graph in a second for that. We put together um, one of the first things at Chiari Care was, you know, we need to standardize the imaging that we're getting so that we can all look at the same things. And when we get MRIs today, they'll be compared with what MRIs look like in a year or in five years. And so all the surgeons have agreed to utilize the same protocol that contains everything that we need but nothing extraneous. So you can get through an entire brain, an entire spine in under two hours, um, but get everything that you need without um, having to come back and forth a million times for different scans. Um, and we're going to put this on our website so that for patients who are out of town and want to know what imaging they should get or share with their physicians if they're not seeing a neurosurgeon yet, um, we're going to make this available for everyone so they can um, utilize the same standardization of imaging. 
here's the idea that herniation changes by age. This is a subtle change. I mean, these are these are small numbers here, millimeters here, but definitely the change of the, the tonsils has been documented um, throughout age. They sort of come down a little bit and then ascend as you get older, as the brain atrophies slightly. All right, question seven. Only a few more. Okay, what percentage of individuals with Chiari malformation, malformation have an associated syringomyelia? We're gonna talk about syrinx next real briefly, so I wanted to see what you guys think. How many patients you think with Chiari have syringomyelia? This is if you look at large population studies. These are not patients who are having surgery or patients in my office. Thousands and thousands of patients with Chiari, how many have syringomyelia? What do you think? I think 25%. <laughs> And that's what most of you guys think as well. You're pretty smart. Do you guys know all this? Am I like being redundant here? Do you guys know all this information already? Okay, so Chiari and Syringomyelia. This is a really important topic and um, I could, again, I can spend an entire lecture on this. I can spend an entire lecture talking about Syringomyelia and scoliosis. All these topics are, are so interesting and so intertwined. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a flavor. And as you're hearing my talk here, and as I'm sort of whetting your appetite as to different things, I want you to keep track of what's interesting to you because one of the important things we're gonna do at the end, the last question on the poll is gonna be, what do you want us to do future sessions about? What are you interested in? Right? These sessions are for you guys and to learn from us. Um, and so we wanna learn from you. So keep track. If there's something that seems really interesting, I wish we, I heard a little bit more about that, let us know and we'll put together a seminar series for you on, on those topics. So it, it might be different um, if you look in adults. This is in children, for example, but it's a huge population-based study, again, done out of uh, Michigan where they've done a tremendous amount of uh, data mining from large data sets of MRI scans. And out of kids who have Chiari, whether they're incidental or symptomatic, about a quarter of them do have syringomyelia. A huge percentage of those patients will go on to surgery. So our population that we see in the office that have surgery, a huge percentage of those patients will have a syringomyelia. But just in terms of that, um, coincident nature, it's about 23%. The very, very top of the cervical spine, really the bottom of the brainstem is often spared, but the cervical spine is the most common place where syrinx is located, septations are present. The lower thoracic and lumbar regions are, are usually spared, and if, and if there is syrinx there, then we look more closely for things like tethered cord um, or other lesions that might be causing them. The etiology for um, syringomyelia is, um, debated. Um, again, a great topic that we talk about in our clinical conferences all the time. Um, the basic idea here is that the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid in the spine have a normal pattern of circulation. They communicate. And there's something that has gone awry in patients with Chiari because of blockage of flow at the skull base. And whether it's related to just CSF in the subarachnoid space or related to venous pulsations or actual pressure on the um, uh, outflow of where the CSF communicates between the brain and the spine, those can be debated. But there's clear dissociation between the CSF and the brain and the spine, and reestablishing that communication between the brain and the spine is what al alleviates and reduces the syringomyelia. Um, and so we'll show some pictures of that later. But that's a clear connection between the two of them here. People hear lots of different terms, and just this is an important slide just so people can know that there are different terms that people use, and they all generally mean the same thing with, with some slight differences. So if you hear syrinx, that's what people usually say, but syrinx, syringomyelia, hydromyelia, syringobulbia, if it's higher up in the brainstem, dilated central canal sometimes gets confused for what a syrinx is. But these are really important things. It can be caused by a whole bunch of different etiologies, tumors, for example, tethered cords, trauma, spelled wrong. Um, shunting, uh, all types of things. And Chiari is really just one of them. And so when we see patients who have Chiari malformation, sorry, when we see patients who have syringomyelia, Chiari malformation is something that's on our checklist, but it's not the only thing that can cause it. And so while there's a direct relationship between Chiari and syrinx, uh, the reverse can't be said. And there are definitely patients that I'm sure the CSF is, um, the, the organization CSF, um, takes care of and is interested in who don't have Chiari. And that's a, that's a whole separate conversation, serving Amelia in the absence of Chiari. That might be an interesting talk for another day. This is a, a slide that I borrowed from Mark a few years ago um, that I thought was really fascinating. I think it was before I was even in practice. I think, yeah, 2004, talking about, you know, well, what do surgeons do with syringomyelia? Does it mean automatic surgery? Well, these are pretty, you know, pretty compelling numbers here. Um, if you have um, an asymptomatic Chiari, so 
a, a CARA that's seen on MRI scan but not causing any symptoms, and a syrinx. If that CARA is eight millimeters, about three quarters of surgeons are gonna operate on that patient, on an asymptomatic patient. I don't know if that's necessarily the same number if we polled today. I think that number had, would probably be lower than that. Um, but I think the really interesting thing here is this, right? So why does it matter what the size of the herniation is if the reason they're operating is because of the syrinx, right? Clearly the reason that, people, that the surgeons are operating is because of the syrinx, and yet there's some kind of influence there on the actual size of the malformation. That's a, just a brilliant little thing that the, the folks who wrote the questionnaire threw in there because it really shows um, a real um, lack of clarity in, in what the understanding is of why we're doing surgery um, and how these things are related. Again, we're not going to talk about scoliosis today, but I'd love to talk about that another time. Sensory disturbance in Chiara. So how is syrinx related to the symptoms? Well, clearly, as the central canal dilates in syringomyelia, it starts putting pressure on some of these fibers. And, and some of the important fibers that get affected are the fibers that cross right around the middle of the spinal canal. You can see this graphic as that blue line, that blue circle dilates up. It's actually compressing some of these fibers that cross. And those are important fibers that are sensory fibers. These are pathways that subserve the sensation that you have. And so this is what leads to the parasitic that so many Chiari patients have in their hands, right? If you have a syrinx in the cervical spine and these nerves are coming in in your fingertips and going into your cervical spine, the blockage of that transmission is what leads to the symptom, um, but it's completely related to the, the radiology and the pathology of the, of the syringomyelia. <coughs> this is classically called a dissociated sensory loss because some of the sensory fibers are spared and, and some are affected. Hydrocephalus is really, really important when we talk about Chiari. It's really important we rule it out in terms of um, subtle forms of hydrocephalus, something called pseudotumor. It's really important to rule that out before we operate on adult patients, mostly. Um, but there are lots of different forms of hydrocephalus, lots of different definitions for hydrocephalus, um, and lots of different algorithms. Treating the hydrocephalus first is really one of the most important things that um, we do. Um, there are rare examples where the hydrocephalus is directly caused by the Chiari malformation, uh, and we can um, debate, and neurosurgeons debate this all the time as to the, the role and, and direction of treating the Chiari first or treating the hydrocephalus first, right? Which one actually preceded the other? Um, but operating in the presence of hydrocephalus is generally not a good idea as it leads to uh, potential risks of CSF leak and the, the problems that are associated with that, and infections and, and repeat surgeries. Um, again, something we can talk about a ton um, another time. I think we only have a couple more questions here. Question number eight. Okay, this is audience participation here. What is your most bothersome symptom with Chiari malformation? <coughs> or your loved ones, if you don't have it. Let's you can only pick one. Uh, <laughs> Most bothersome. If you've ever been in, in my clinic, you know that one of the most important questions is what is the single most bothersome symptom that you have if you can snap your fingers and get rid of? And, that, and that's really important because there's often, there is often a number one and then a number two through 15, but number one is often really the most important. So let's see what you guys said. All right. As expected, headache, neck pain is really, was that me? No? That was you. You can lower that, it's good. <laughs> just a little bit. So let's look at the symptoms of Chiari malformation a little bit here. The, the classic signs and symptoms of Chiari, right? The headache is obviously at the top of the list here, occipital cervical, tussive, meaning you know, cough-induced or strain-induced, exertional headaches, neck and shoulder pain. But the list really is long, and this is certainly not a comprehensive list. Of if, if your symptoms are not on the list, this is not meant to be an affront and that it's not part of Chiari. But these are the ones that are classically defined as part of the complex here. Um, I've highlighted in red some of the really confusing ones, the things that we really don't know a whole lot about. The autonomic instability, you know, the POTS, the autonomic part of the brainstem being related to where a lot of the compression occurs from both the odontoid and, and the Chiari malformation has lumped these things together. But is that really Chiari malformation or is that something else? And that's important. Again, the second part of the talk when we try to figure out how these diseases are associated or not associated, um, those will become important here. If you haven't had the opportunity to go onto the website and, and look at um, some of the videos, really great video by Dr. Grant at Stanford, who I think is just really thoughtful about this 
entire condition. And I gave a whole lecture on what this is. What is the cognitive part of Chiari malformation? Why do so many people complain of difficulties with concentration and memory and this brain fog? And why in the world does it get better in so many patients, right? I never ever tell patients that they're gonna get rid of their brain fog with Chiari malformation because I don't understand why they have it. So it would be foolish for me to recommend that they do surgery for that reason. But a lot of them do get better. And I think we have a lot to learn about that. But each one of these things in themselves can be an interesting dissertation for someone to figure out. But I recommend going and looking at some of those talks because these are some really thoughtful approaches to some really difficult questions. Why is it hard to understand outcomes in Chiari? Well, this is part of what this amazing PCORI study that's being hosted in um, uh, WashU in St. Louis is really designed to get at. There's so many different types of operations that are offered that understanding the results is completely skewed by what any individual surgeon has chosen or has decided upon with their patient, right? Doing bone-only decompressions sort of became very popular about a decade ago. Um, and the jury's really still out on that. Are the outcomes really as good as opening up the dura? What about splitting the difference, literally? Split thickness duraplasty. So open the dura a little bit, right? How do you compare that in a large population study um, with um, patients who have had the dura opened. Is that a question? No. Or, or are you just hiding your eyes from the brain? Sorry, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you when the brains are gone. Um, when you do a duraplasty, like tons of different options. Like how do you close the dura? Do you use your own tissue, right? Something called uh, autograph. Do you use the tissue from another animal, from a, a cow uh, heart, for example, which is often used. There are synthetic grafts that can be used. There's some people that open up the dura and don't close it. You just leave it open. So there's no graphs. So how do you compare that against all these things? And then if you open up the dura, do you open up the arachnoid? Or do you leave the arachnoid closed? What do you do with the tonsils? Do you shrink the tonsils? Do you put a stent in to actually divert fluid around the fourth ventricle down to the subarachnoid space? People used to actually plug the obex, thinking that that restored flow uh, between the brain and the spine. And then the different types of things that you use to make these decisions are just as varied as the types of operations. People use ultrasound, intraoperative MRI, CT. Some people monitor and make decisions based on neurophysiological monitoring. You know, what is the role of stabilization of the skull base, right? OC fusion. There are a lot of surgeons who do lots and lots of OC fusions for patients. It's not clear who needs it and who doesn't. I think we're still figuring that out. Who needs the odontoid resected? What's the role of pseudotumor, IIH, and hydrocephalus and all this? So when you start looking at the algorithm here, it can become exhaustive. You know, I'm a little pessimistic that we're going to learn too much from this trial, um, even though I think it's a brilliant idea and long overdue. So I think there's so much variation. Even if two surgeons decide they're both going to do the same operation, they may do it subtly different ways uh, and achieve subtly different results. So I think this is part of the problem, um, and it's something that I think we're going to face for a while, for sure, uh, in the Chiari field. This is the idea, right? So this is what I deem a good radiographic result. I always couch this as a radiographic result because I think, as I always tell my patients as well, whether or not I do a good job does, has nothing to do with what the MRI scan looks like in three months, right? When you come in the office, I'm going to know whether or not I did a good job or not. It has no, nothing to do with the MRI scan. And I'm going to show you lots of examples later of great outcomes that I'm really proud to show where the patients didn't get better. So is that a success, right? How do you judge that outcome um, in this field? Really, really tricky, right? This is a success, right? So this is a young child who had syringomyelia, clearly dilation of the spinal cord in the cervical region, Chiari decompression done. This is an extra dural decompression, so dura was not opened. And clearly there's resolution here of the syrinx. Is the patient better? Do the patient's balance get better, incontinence get better? Those are the questions that are really important. The radiographs are our guides for us, but I think sometimes we get a little bit too hung up on what the MRI looks like and the measurements on there and forget that it's really about the symptoms in the patient. And again, that's what the algorithm that I'm describing for you is really trying to get back at is, let's make this about the symptoms and about the patient and less about what the MRI shows. Okay, so generally we could say that, you know, outcomes are generally good, but variability in treatment makes this assessment really hard. Right? There's lots of things that go on here. And then at the bottom here, I think this is really important. The variability in assessment complicates it even further. So a study just came out last year that looked at um, outcomes in different types of carry malformation surger surgeries. 
And 6% of all of the studies that have been done, and there have been hundreds of studies for Chiari, only 6% of them actually asked the patients about how they felt about their results. It's all about surgeon assessment and radiographic results. I mean, that's pathetic, right? I mean, we're not doing a good job if we're not asking the patients how they're doing. So in response, a lot of really smart guys have put together Chiari-specific scales, right? Assessment scales, disability scales, quality of life scales, and that's what we really need to talk about. Again, if you come to see us at Chiari Care, we talk all about quality of life. The decisions are about not whether or not you need the surgery or not, but are you being affected? Can you work? Is your child going to school? These are the things that really matter when we're making these decisions. Um, as you can see, it's extremely complicated. We're trying to figure it out. Okay, so I showed this slide before, and I just want to get back to it because I think, you know, the, the, the big question here, you know, how do we link all this stuff together, all these different types of conditions and all the different types of surgeries require, require a little bit more thought and algorithm in terms of how we link them all together. So what we are faced with is a lack of cohesion linking these conditions together. So you may have um, one physician define something as a Chiari and another person not, but more importantly, you might have this two different doctors offer two completely different approaches to the exact same pathology. So this is our attempt here to, to start thinking about this, and it's an algorithm that I've been working on for a couple of years, um, and I've gotten input from a lot of um, neurosurgeons around the country, and I think we're trying to put this together into a, a way and then look back at our you know, several hundred patients who we've operated on and see whether or not um, it's a relevant um, way to define and to um, link these conditions in a way that um, makes more sense than calling them all Chiari. So they're clearly not. So if they're not Chiari, then what are they? So this is a kind of a, a crazy slide. It just sort of it, um, it, it links together all of my thoughts on this topic in um, a way that has been dynamic, meaning that it, I change this slide every few weeks as I sort of think about another way to rearrange things. But it's what the title says. So rethinking Chiari malformation. It's a way to make decisions for what really is chronic posterior fossa compression syndrome. This is not my term for this. I'm not taking credit for any of this. Posterior fossa compression syndrome has been something that um, luminaries and neurosurgeons have been talking about for decades. But it really does, in a very simple way, link together a lot of different conditions that have always just been called Chiari. So what I want to do with this algorithm here, and um, it sort of reads from left to right here. So these are six different categories of patients who may have MRIs that are read as Chiari, but may present with very different subtle differences in the type of pathology, and more importantly, have very different types of symptoms. And then what that leads to is a different way to evaluate them and a different way to treat them. And so it gets at this question of, you know, all Chiari is not the same. How do we define this a little bit better? So I'll go through them. Again, you know, I've, def I've defined it in, in sort of a cutesy way so that, you know, each title spells out Chiari, right? That's just my own way of remembering it here. So whether it's CSF, head and neck pain, instability, autonomic, revision surgery, or intracranial pressure dynamics, right? So C-H-I-A-R-I. -I. They are really very, very different you know, entities, syndromes, conditions, whatever you want to call them. And I think they really deserve to be looked at in a different way. And I treat these patients differently depending on, on, on what they have. And so I'm going to go through them in a, in a one by one fashion here and give you a sense for, for how this works. So just to start with C, CSF, I think this might be the easiest one in my mind. I feel very comfortable with the way we treat these patients and the outcomes are ex exceptionally good. So these are patients who have syringomyelia or hydrocephalus, a derangement in cerebral spinal fluid flow. The reason why this is easy is because you just need to fix what we know is wrong, right? So for so many of these conditions, we don't know what's wrong. But when you have a syrinx, we know there's a problem with cerebral spinal fluid flow between the brain and the spine. So you just got to fix that problem. And there are lots of ways you can go about that. Um, but essentially, um, doing a suboccipital craniectomy, usually a C1 laminectomy, Doing an autologous duraplasty, so here's the treatment, um, is um, exceptionally effective at turning this very, very large syrinx in this child with an incidentally found syrinx, 
like I said before, into almost a normal looking spinal cord, all right? So no surgery on the spinal cord itself, but just a change in the pressure dynamics between the brain and the spine. Just that a little bit of fluid flow created at the base of the skull allows that syrinx to reduce. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I mean, I think that you can go to our website. We're gonna share all these videos. You can look at them as much as you want. But just to get a sense for well, what surgery looks like, I just thought it would be maybe good to just to sort of show a little bit of a video, give you a sense of, of what, um, what it means to go through PRA surgery. A little four-year-old girl. Same idea, right? So compression of the outflow of fluid at the skull base, a syrinx. Okay. What does surgery look like? Well, this is what surgery is, right? So there's, there's nothing, you know, pretty about this. It's real big-time surgery. It's general anesthesia. Your head is held in these pins. You put it on a padded, uh, on a padded bed. And you get this, you know, region of the back of your head shaved, and um, the surgery goes down right through a midline incision. So again, this isn't minimally invasive surgery by any stretch. Very, very straightforward surgery for us in terms of what we do. It's very bloodless. It's very well defined anatomy. It's very relaxed. This is not like clipping aneurysms where you lose liters of blood during surgery. It's very, very, very straightforward in terms of what we do here. Go right down the middle, cut the muscle down the middle here. I'm gonna skip through it, I'll, again, we're gonna share all these videos for you guys if you want them. Drilling is, again, it's pretty simple. It's not like we take off a whole lot of bone at once. We just basically thin out the bone. Little curettes, remove the bone at the base of the skull. I'm gonna pop around here a little bit just to speed through here. Taking off the arch of C1. Drilling out the bone at the base of the skull is extremely important at the very, very lateral edges. There are these thick ligaments that invest on top of the dura here. Simple, we take these little tools. You can now see the, the brain pulsing over here. That's the dura, that's completely intact still. So that's just the covering of the brain. Right, so now that's the dura over the spinal cord, and that's the dura over the brain. Drilling off a little bit more bone. This is an ultrasound intraoperatively showing the pulsation of the tonsils. This is the tonsil, that's the brainstem. You can see how dynamic this process is. So we're actually looking through the dura at the brain. This gives us a real-time assessment of how much compression still might exist and how much more surgery needs to be done. We gotta open up the dura. And we put in a patch, and I think I'll leave it there. I'm going to show you some more of the, of the brain part of it, but I think there's not too much. Um, people ask a lot about the tonsils and what do you do once you're actually looking at the brain. So here we are now, the dura is open. So this little area here is where the dura has been open. It's like a, a rectangle. And this is the left cerebellar tonsil, and that's the right cerebellar tonsil. I'm going to show a quick little video clip here of what it means to cauterize the tonsils. People always want to know about this, and do you cauterize the tonsils, do you not? It's a very, very simple, straightforward thing. The answer is sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. It depends on the symptoms, it depends on the patient, it depends on what you find intraoperatively. If you're dogmatic about your approach to Chiari surgery, and you do the same operation, even though we know that all the patients are different, then I, and then I think you've lost a little bit of the flavor of what you're doing. So I don't do the same thing for every patient. So here's, here's a tonsil, it's being lifted up. You see the brain pulsing quite a bit. You see the cerebral spinal fluid, that clear fluid is around. That's the brain stem now, and right in the middle there is the obex. That's the opening of the spinal cord where the syrinx can, the blocking of which can cause the, the syrinx. So here, I'm just applying a little bit of heat. You see how they shrink up? It's not all that exciting or, or, or mind-blowing, I, I promise you. People um, make a little bit too much of it. And so what you do is you shrink the tonsils back, and now look, you can see a whole other level of the spinal cord and brainstem that you couldn't see before. And that's it. So whether you do it or not, I think you can talk about. And that's what an autologous duraplasty looks like once it's sewn in, right? Watertight, you can see it bulging up, no fluids leaking around it. And that's a patch of dura that is made from your own tissue underneath your scalp, okay? That's a pretty routine duraplasty surgery. The muscles then close, the skin's closed, and, and that's that. 
So what's the deal with this Daryl Sparing operation, right? I think this, this became popularized a decade ago. It wasn't something that I learned um, was an option to train in. Um, I trained with Dr. Swedan, and so when, when I learned how to do QR search, it wasn't something that we did. Um, but enough reports came out that showed that there were some good results, right? So patients definitely had good outcomes. They were um, leaving the hospital faster. The, the surgeries were definitely a little bit shorter. But a certain percentage of patients didn't get better and needed to have a second surgery. And so that decision-making process boils down to, do you want a surgery that's a slightly longer surgery um, with slightly or maybe minimally, depending on whose hands you're talking about, more risk? Um, or do you want to take the chance that you might need to have further surgery down the line? When I have this conversation with patients, I think it's important to you know, weigh in what their own feelings are about this. And, and what I find is that when you, when you look at patients who have had dural sparing operations and they have partial symptom relief, I find them to be the most tortured patients because they know that they're better and they wonder whether or not they could be even better. And so you've gone halfway, and you don't really know where you would have gone if you've gone all the way. And so it's, um, I try to guide patients towards doing duraplasties. I prefer to do it. I think it's a more complete operation. But in the absence of syringomyelia, I think there is a, a place for it. And I have had some good results, and I have some patients that I do this on. And so I think, again, I'm not dogmatic about it. I think if someone really just has a compressive etiology where the bone is compressing the dura and there's compression of the tonsils, Maybe they have some neck and shoulder pain, but they don't have neurologic symptoms. There's no yet clear evidence that their brainstem is dysfunctional. They don't have cranial neuropathies. They don't have the numbness and tingling or hearing loss or dizziness. And it's just the pain. Well, I think this might be a really good population to do this in. And I think if, you're, if you fit those criteria and you are willing to accept that there may be um, some degree of um, need for further surgery, I think that this is the population of patients where I recommend it and I think they do well. Patients with syrinx, um, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, there are some patients that have been reported where the syrinx does resolve, and I think um, the, the caveat to that is sometimes you have to wait several years for full syrinx resolution versus you know, what we know can happen in a matter of days or weeks um, with the traditional surgery. So um, still, still, still to be determined and why this big clinical trial is gonna be really important at helping to answer that question. I'm not gonna show you this video because it's essentially the same. But I do wanna show you a couple of little clips here because I think when we think about whether or not to open up the dura or not, sometimes we're surprised, right? I think, you know, we find things during surgery that we weren't necessarily expecting. That's part of, you know, um, getting experienced and, and doing this a lot is that you start to realize, well, this is normal, this isn't normal. This is just a less than a minute video here. I'm sorry that the video is not even in the middle. I don't think we were videoing anything in particular here. I think the camera just was on for the microscope. and. Um, we found something interesting. So this is the bone is being taken off. This is a case where the bone wasn't terribly thick, so we didn't have to drill it off piecemeal like we often do, but we actually took a big chunk of it out. And as we try to lift off the bone, off the dura, we realized it was stuck. And so we start peeling it back and peeling it back. We're like, what's going on here? And so, dun, dun, dun. So what is going on there? There it looks like the bone is basically diving into the dura there. Right? So as you see, as you start to pull this up here, this has heretofore become referred to as the shark tooth video because there appears to be you know, this big you know, spear of bone that we couldn't appreciate on the MRI scan, even when we went back and looked later, um, basically digging into the skull. And so that, digging into the dura. Uh, and that is a great indication for where you can do a dural sparing etiolo uh, surgery because of the etiology, right? So we know where the pathology is here. This patient had headaches, and I'm going to show you the, the shark tooth. Kind of looks like a surfboard also. If you know that the pathology is, is a bad headache and you see that there's a, a good compressive etiology, look at that thing. That thing's digging into the back of your brain. You're going to have a headache, right? So that's a, that's a great indication for, for when the surgery works. But then there, are, then there are some circumstances where it's not the bone, and it's actually under the arachnoid here. Right? So this is a patient who has a syrinx, and there are a lot of patients who would A, not open up the dura, and B, not open up the arachnoid, but that would, that would have missed a lot of pathology here. So this is a widely opened dura, and now the brain is reversed in this one, I apologize. So the head, of the, the head is up this way towards the right. The, the spinal cord is down here. That's the brain stem and spinal cord. This is arachnoid that we're cutting here. So when we say arachnoid sparing or removal, so these are all little adhesions that are being just sort of cut and, and trimmed out around the brainstem. 
these are the tonsils here that are herniating down. I'm going to we'll slowly slide a couple of little cotinoids, little patties in between there here just to sort of open up the space. You'll see as we get down there, the obex, the region through which the communication of the spinal fluid in the brain and the spinal fluid in the spine connects, is obstructed. Not indicated on the MRI scan. And I'll sh I'm going to show you exactly where that is in a second here. Look at that little band, that little adhesion there. Getting down there. It's like a suspenseful movie, I know. There we go. Of course, we're teaching residents the whole time here, so it's, it's a little bit more painful. And there we go. And so now we're down at the obex there. And you can actually see, I'm going to point it out to you, that there's a little opening right here that's completely occluded. Normally you see a, a little channel right between the brain and the spine, but there's, right where the scissors are cutting there, there's an adhesion, a band, that's blocking the fluid there. Something that you could not see, and now you can see, we're gonna pop into it right there. Look at that, as we lift up, all of a sudden that little channel opens up, and we're now communicated between the brain and the spine. And if you hadn't done this exploration, if you hadn't gone intraarachnoidal or intradural, you would have missed this pathology, and I think that there's no chance I mean, I think zero chance that this syrinx would have resolved without a duraplasty. So again, there are some cases where it might work, and there are some cases where it definitely wouldn't work. And this is a situation where, and you can see how widely patent that little opening is now, just by those little adhesions and, and little bands of tissue that had formed there. Okay? So sometimes we just don't know until we're in there. So those are the two most simple cases, right? So sort of the syrinx case, the headache case. But then we get into these cases that I don't think really refer themselves as Chiari very well. I don't, I don't think that we do justice to call them Chiari malformations. These are craniocervical junction abnormalities. These are patients of instability of the skull base. They often have connective tissue diseases. When I see this scan, this MRI or X-ray, when the spinal column looks like a snake, looks like an S, I immediately think this, this is an unstable situation. Not unstable like the head's going to fall off, but unstable in terms of the connective tissue, the ligaments are loose. And what happens when the ligaments are loose at the base of the skull is that there's intermittent compression and stress on the brainstem. Okay? This is, you know, seems like a novel concept to neurosurgeons, but, you know, joints that are loose around the rest of the body get treated as unstable all the time, knees and elbows, right? The skull base is really just another joint, except that it's protecting the most vital piece of tissue that we have, the brainstem. And so when there's too much mobility there, it creates a stress and tension and creates these symptoms. Um, so these patients are challenging, right? They need to have stabilization of the spine. Sometimes they have Chiari malformations, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they need stabilization below C2. Sometimes they just need C1 and C2 stabilized to the skull. Sometimes they need a decompression because the brainstem is also compressed by, by their cerebellar tonsils. Sometimes they also have a syrinx. Right? You start beginning to get a sense for how subdivided these are and how each of these cases really needs to be dealt with as an individual basis here. So this is a patient who just needed to be stabilized. Once the spinal cord was relieved of the stress of having the joint, the craniocervical joint, flexing too much and creating stress on the brainstem, the symptoms resolved. So we didn't have to do anything to the brain itself. We just had to take the pressure off of it by putting that fusion in there. Now, fusion surgery is tough. And there, there are people in the room who can tell you, uh, several of you, but um, you know, if you've got brainstem symptoms, um, it's unlikely that those are going to be resolved if you've got underlying instability, unless you're fused. And if you don't get fused, those symptoms can get worse. So we're not even going to talk about that right now, but failed surgery is a huge, huge problem in our field. All right, so you can have a Chiari surgery. This is a patient who had invagination of the brainstem by the odontoid. Clear compression there, but they had a Chiari too. And so the surgeon, a Chiari also, not a Chiari too. So the, the surgeon who operated on this lady did a Chiari decompression. But what happened? Well, the impression got worse, right? The problem wasn't the Chiari malformation. It was part of it. It was clearly part of the underlying um, 
skull base anomaly, but the real problem in terms of the symptoms was actually ventral. This was compression at the ventral brainstem, and you can see that after surgery got worse because there was no stabilization done. And so this lady needed to have stabilization and, in this case, resection of the odontoid as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And just look at the angle. If you see nothing else here, look at the angle of the brainstem to the spinal cord. It's making a right turn. And then look at it here, right? This is a day before surgery, a day after surgery. And that's pretty dramatic here. And this, you know, this is work that I think has been, you know, fringe for a while in neurosurgery. These are some big names in nurses that really have to be given credit for sort of pushing this field and bringing it forward into where we are today. Um, there's a whole new generation of younger surgeons who are standing on the shoulders of some of these giants. But I think that we need to have a better idea of understanding which patients need this, which patients get better, and then start looking at some of the longer term outcomes from patients who undergo this. Because I think the numbers are so small that if we as a community, it's something that the CSF can do for us, uh, if we don't start compiling our data the way they're doing for a simple Chiari in these complex cases, I think we're going to get further and further behind instead of further forward. So these are complex Chiari cases for sure. Dysautonomia is part of what we call the brainstem compression sim syndrome, right? So patients who have cardiac abnormalities, urologic abnormalities, sleep apnea, difficulty speaking, aspiration, POTS, right? Their blood pressure is dysregulated. That's not the Chiari malformation. That's not the cerebellum itself herniating down. That's the actual brainstem is dysfunctional. And that can either be from an inherent dysfunction, right? There are patients who don't have Chiari or brainstem compression who have dysautonomia. But in our population, for our purposes, these are patients who have brainstem compression. You can't see it uh, any better here than this patient. I think this is a 14-year-old boy who has compression from the front, compression from the back. I mean, his brainstem is just getting squeezed. Um, and, and had some serious problems with that. And so this is a situation which requires decompression from the back and decompression from the front and fusion, right? So here's pre-op and here's post-op. That's a happy brainstem compared to that brainstem right there. This is a big, big surgery to go through. This is actually multiple surgeries to go through. Um, so not something you can take lightly, but again, Lumping this in with Chiari would be a huge mistake, right? Because if we look at the outcomes from patients who have simple decompression with this Chiari patient, who clearly has Chiari, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice because the outcomes are going to be very, very different. The scales are going to be different because the goals are very different. So we can't think about them all as Chiari. They have to think about this as brainstem compression with eventual brainstem compression etiology. And that's how I think about it, and I put those in a separate category. And we have these these sister diseases and conditions and syndromes, right? EDS, this wasn't talked about 20 years ago as being part of Chiari, but connective tissue disorders are, are well known um, to play a role in instability of the craniocervical junction, okay? And EDS is not the only one. I have patients with, with Marfan syndrome, with other types of connective tissue disorders where the structural problem is in the collagen that holds all of the structure together. And if you have a deficit in that, then you get instability, and then you get symptoms from the brain being compressed. We don't talk too much about POTS and the autonomic stuff, because I've already mentioned it. But again, if you look at how richly innervated all of these organs are from the autonomic nervous system, then you sort of get an idea of, well, how can you get tachycardia from Chiari? How can you have breathing difficulties or digestive difficulties? You know, how do you have issues with, you know, incontinence? Well, these are all related to the brainstem. And so once you start looking at the anatomy and the pathophysiology, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but it's hard to make those links. It's really hard to draw those links in, in someone's mind and say, well, we're going to fix your brain up here and stabilize you so that you can urinate better. It's a tough sell, but it, the, the anatomy makes sense and the patients get better when they're selected correctly. And so when we put these all together here, we get this POTS eds Chiari syndrome. So... Again, we're not going to talk too much about that right now. Here's another patient, right? So this is a 17-year-old female who first presented about five years ago, who presented in a very interesting way, right? With sort of classic Chiari symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. Had weakness. They actually thought that this young lady had a stroke. Turned out they had a whopping Chiari malformation here. Went through surgery, did well, but then started developing all these new symptoms, just like this other lady that I mentioned before who had Chiari decompression surgery and started developing dysautonomia symptoms. So did this patient. I thought maybe there was an issue with, with a pseudotumor or IH. We put in an ICP monitor. There was no pressure problem. 
then they started developing new problems that were pointing more towards the brainstem. And you can see that the angle of the brainstem, again, started to change, started to become more kinked. And so the decision after a pretty significant dysautonomia workup ended up being fusion and resection of the odonto. And again, you can see the brainstem is now lo no longer under stress. And you get resolution of the dysautonomia. But this is an evolution. These, these processes are all, all interconnected. Would I have ever suggested doing a fusion up front at this point, knowing what I know now? I don't think so. I think, you know, we just don't know. We can't predict well enough who's going to have a problem down the road to put someone through such an invasive surgery. Um, but these are the types of things that we have to follow and why surgery um, is never just surgery and you're done. And so when, you know, patients hear, well, I fixed your Chiari, I don't need to take care of you anymore, I can understand why that elicits more than just frustration because clearly these are complex conditions that will sometimes evolve over time. So what does that mean to take out the odontoid? I thought maybe you guys would like to see this. This is pretty awesome. So something that people ask me all the time, you know, is, you know, do you just do Chiari surgery? Are you a Chiari expert? I don't really know what, I don't really know what that means, to be honest with you. I love taking care of Chiari patients, but I think the other things that I do inform my Chiari practice in ways that I never imagined. So I take care of patients with pituitary tumors, particularly children, and so we operate on these kids by um, using small endoscopes through their nose. And it turns out that this is a really great way to get to the tip of the odontoid. Again, 20 years ago, when, when pioneers like Menezes were you know, trying to figure out these problems, they were doing these very, very invasive surgeries through the mouth, cutting through the palate, cutting through the back of the, the mouth that required feeding tubes and um, prolonged intubations. And so the fact that we can now translate techniques from one part of our, my world to another uh, has been really rewarding. And so we actually can take out odontoids through the nose with little endoscopes. This is essentially incisionless surgery as far as this, the, the patient is, is concerned. This is about as bad as it gets, so I, I thought I'd give you this as an example of how we can do this. This is a woman who has rheumatoid arthritis, right? So not Chiari at all. But she's got the same exact problem that a lot of Chiari patients with complex Chiari have. That is, they've got invagination of the odontoid, basilar invagination, basilar impression. That bone is actually literally digging into the brainstem. You can see it here. This bone right there is actually supposed to be down here. And so the whole skull has slipped, and the spinal cord is digging up into the brain, like, um, like an ice cream cone melting and the, the stick going up into the ice cream. And so you know, well, how, do you, how do you approach this technically? That's about as difficult as it gets, but with little cameras and little endoscopes, um, we can achieve some pretty remarkable things here. So this is a little one minute video here. This is a camera parked at the back of the nose, underneath the sphenoid sinus, underneath the clivus. So this is actually just um, pulling down some soft tissue. That's all that there is to get through between um, the sinuses and, and the odontoid. And so again, same instruments, little tiny drills, we have really amazing neuronavigation, so our instruments are actually being tracked all the time, so we can see on a live MRI scan where we are at all times. We do these cases in a special OR that has an intraoperative CT, so we actually will stop at some point during the case, get a scan, and see how much bone is left, see where the anatomy is, and then re-navigate with the, with the new um, with the new CT scan. So uh, it's pretty it's pretty remarkable where this field has come in a short period of time. So. Doesn't look like much, but we're drilling through the bottom of the odontoid. We're essentially disarticulating that bone, and then you're going to start to see how we, it starts to come down. Just another 30 seconds or so. So there's a big hole where the odontoid used to be, and now there's a peg that's sticking up into the brainstem. Remember, you saw that picture there. So we're grabbing it, and look at that. We're literally pulling that bone down, decompressing the brainstem, and there it pops out. There's nothing more rewarding than that. And so there's the, the tip of the odontoid is now in the back of the throat. We put the tissue back up, and then we're done. So that used to be a, you know, a highly morbid operation. And this was you know, a really, really sick woman on immunosuppressive medications for a rheumatoid who left the hospital three days later. And if you want to see what it looks like, this is what the bone looked like before, digging into the brain stem. And then here's the brainstem afterwards. So that's just been removed. And you can see the carter pretty clearly there. It's a, it's a straight <laughs> shot. So that's sort of the, the, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of Chiari surgery. But then there are a lot of patients that the CSF are taking care of that are interested in you know, lumping in, bringing in, 
figuring out their association with Chiari that I think get ignored all the time. And this is a big population, so I don't know exactly what to name R. I'm thinking redo surgery, refractory symptoms. These are all the patients that say, I've had surgery and I'm not any better. Well, what can I do? And these are the patients that get ignored the vast majority of the time by their surgeons or by other doctors who don't want to deal with the most difficult patients who have already failed surgery. So you know, what do we do with these patients? It's really hard. This is a woman who came to me who clearly didn't have resolution of her syringomyelia, but more importantly, she didn't have resolution in her symptoms. And it's not difficult to see why. Her dural patch is completely dehissed there. There's a big opening. CSF is coming out from the brain into this pseudomeningocele seal here. And the syrinx won't resolve because you haven't reestablished flow there. So we went in and we fixed, fixed the leak. The syringomyelia has resolved, but all of her objective measures are better, but she still has persistent pain and fatigue. So is that a successful outcome? I don't know. It depends on what metric you're using. Right? She wasn't happy. I looked at the MRI scan and I thought it would look great. Um, but that's why it's really important that we include patients in terms of discriminating success versus failure. This is a, another failure, right? So this is a seven, eight-year-old girl who had surgery and had every single complication you can think of, right? She had a CSF leak, meningitis. She had the wrong decompression, right? Her decompression was way too big. Look how big that decompression is. But actually where the decompression was needed, it wasn't decompressed with the very bottom of the skull base. She had a worsening syrinx, not an improving syrinx. And she started becoming incontinent and in developing incapacitating leg pain. And so this was kind of like a heroic surgery in terms of the number of things that we had to do and fix. Taking muscle off of the duraplasty that was done, finding all this old scar tissue that the brain was scarred to. We had to put a stent in the fourth ventricle to bypass all the scar tissues at the skull base from the infection and the leak a new duraplasty, and then we had to fix the skull base because it was completely herniating out through this enormous defect. And so we fixed the herniation there, we reestablished flow, there's the stent, um, and she woke up without leg pain, and that's, that's incredible. So the syrinx doesn't look any different yet. This is just two days after surgery. But again, I would take this result, the improved leg pain and the resolution of the incontinence, even if the syrinx doesn't get better, right? Because what's your metric? Like we're trying to figure out how to take care of patients and how to improve their symptoms. Here on the other side here, just, just for comparison, this is another patient who came to me, similar age, young boy, and there's a decompression. You might need you know, a magnifying glass to find it, but this is kind of you know, taking minimally invasive to a new level. There's really no decompression done there of, of the brainstem uh, or of the cerebellar tonsils. Compare it to the decompression here. right? This is literally 10 times larger. How can you compare two surgeries that are so different in the same database when the operation is done so differently by two different surgeons? And these are two different surgeons, both in New York, that live 10 miles apart. We're not talking about someone in a different part of the country or a different continent. We're going to have a hard time figuring this out if we can't you know, figure out some consistency in what we do with the patients and, and how we grade them. Um, so uh, this, is, you know, this is a big problem here, these failed surgeries. Two more surgeries. This is a patient who had another one of these little microsurgeries done, almost no bone was removed, but the bone that they do, did remove was enough to create scarring um, that caused the pica vessels, these are arteries that supply blood to the brainstem and the cerebellum, to become scarred to the, to the patch itself. This was technically one of the more challenging redos I've ever done because we were essentially dissecting around an artery for two hours. Post-operative radiographically, it looked great. She didn't get any better. So I thought it was a great surgery, but her symptoms didn't get better. So where do, we, where do we miss that one? Another patient who came with a failed Chiari surgery, persistent syringomyelia, and had burning and dysesthesias in her hands. Postoperatively, look at this result here. New space around the back of the brain stem. Syrinx is almost completely gone. She complained to me for 45 minutes in the office about her symptoms. So is that a successful surgery? I don't think so, you know? I mean, it really depends on how we judge this here. You know, if I didn't take care of her symptoms and address what was wrong with her, then I don't care what the MRI scan looks like here. I think she'll get better. I try to tell her that, but um, it really depends on, you know, what your expectations are for surgery and what you're trying to address. And then you can measure success based upon those parameters. 
So sometimes it's just failed surgery and there are things that you need to fix, right? There's all leak or bone wasn't taken off or the, the tonsils weren't resected when they should have been. Sometimes the initial surgery looks unsuccessful, but when you f fix it, you don't change the outcome. So there's something inherent. Sometimes there's just too much tissue damage done. Sometimes there's been symptoms for so long that no matter what you do, you're not going to reverse it. And these are important things to know, especially when you're counseling patients about going back for surgery another time. It highlights the lack of unanimity in both diagnostic and interventional approaches. So we try to wait, we try to be cautious about this, about trying to go back in. But we have to be thoughtful about what else we can do. What are we missing? You know, can we get a CT and look and see whether or not there's any bone that needs to be taken off? We're actually making 3D skulls now because sometimes MRI scans are really hard to define the bony anatomy on. So we get a CT and we actually make a model. And we can use that to decide, well, do we need to take off more bone? We use this in the operating room. We use it to teach the residents, to inform the patients, and to define our surgeries. So we have some new techniques that we can use here. Sometimes there's a problem with intracranial pressure. But sometimes you just need patience, and sometimes you're not going to make the patient better, and that's hard to sometimes admit. And that brings me to the last category, the eye. So intracranial pressure dynamics, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is a, a really, really important one, and I think probably the thing that I see the most in my office that's thought to be Chiari, but ends up not being Chiari. So these are two MRI scans from two different patients who have very mild Chiari malformations, right? They can have every symptom in the book of Chiari malformation. They've seen two other surgeons say, oh, we don't have Chiari malformation. It's not big enough to operate on, and they get sent away. But if you look here, check, check this out. You've got a lot of CSF around the pituitary gland. That's suggesting maybe that there's some increased pressure. We call it an empty cella syndrome here. And the amount of herniation, two, three millimeters, is very suspicious for me for patients who might have something called intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor. If you've had a lot of weight gain, if you're in the 30 to 40 range as a female, if you've got some of these clinical signs here, I'm going to be highly suspicious that you've got pseudotumor. So I got an MRV on this patient, and lo and behold, what do they have? They actually have a stenosis in one of the large veins that drains the brain. Okay? This is called the transverse sinus. And if your transverse sinus is stenotic or blocked, the fluid in the brain can't drain properly down into the venous channels and back to the heart. And so fluid builds up, you get pressure in your brain, and the tonsils get pushed down. Just like if you had a brain tumor, that's why it's called pseudotumor, or any other kind of mass lesion. But it's not really a QR malformation, it's secondary herniation to pressure. So these are patients who get decompressed all the time and do terribly because you're not actually fixing their problem. And not only do they do terribly, they often have complications like CSF leak because their pressure is so high that the patches can't heal. So when I see this patient and they've got a post-op complication in a CSF leak, I just know right off the bat, well, they've got pseudotumor. And there's some really cool things that my partners can do with this. I don't do this, but interventional neuroradiologists can actually now fix these stenoses with a minimally invasive thing called a stent. Right? People know all about stents for... Uh, cardiac disease, right? People have three, four stents walking around running marathons, they're fine, you just fix the vessel intravascularly. Well, we can actually do the same thing in the brain now. This wasn't possible 10 years ago. You deploy a stent through the vein, pop it open, and the walls of the, of the sinus, the stent, they become normal, and then you release the blockage of fluid, and the CSF can drain. That leads to decreased ICP. We have a clinical trial here at Cornell doing that. Mark Dinkin and Ethos Patsalides lead that. Um, and we're now expanding that to a multi-center trial across the country um, to look at the efficacy of this in, in different types of pseudotumor uh, with visual loss and, and other types of symptoms. This is what the stenosis looks like, and this is before the stent, and this is after the stent. Right? So pretty dramatic. You can pop that vessel open and get a resolution. Avoid Chiari surgery, avoid all the complication. But you have to be thinking about this in a busy practice or else you miss it and you end up with complications. The other end of IIH is even more complicated, and that's if you have a CSF leak that can masquerade as a Chiari herniation. You get CSF dripping down from the spine or out the nose. You get droop and, and drag on the brain or sag of the brain, and it looks like a Chiari malformation for all intents and purposes here, but it's actually a CSF leak. And it's even more complicated than that because sometimes low pressure from a CSF leak can be caused by high pressure. And so patients go through this kind of sine wave where they have high pressure, it causes the leak. They leak and their pressure goes down really low. And then the leak seals and the pressure goes back up. And so depending on where you happen to get the LP or the pressure monitor, you might think you're dealing with two different patients. It just really depends on where they are. And we can fix these through the nose also. So if they've got a skull-based leak, 
Oh, I apologize. I couldn't get the right format on this, so there's a little flip for Mac sign there. But I'll just, I'm just going to skip through this pretty quickly here since it's getting late. But through the nose, we inject a contrast dye called fluorescein into the spinal canal. It turns all of the spinal fluid a fluorescent color that we can see under special lights that you're going to see here. So we basically follow the anatomy. We follow our CT scans to where we think the leak is. And then you can see that green. Look at that. That's where the leak is coming out. That's spinal fluid or brain fluid coming out. We pack it. We remove a little bit of bone, pack some fat or some graft tissue under there, put a little sealant on. You can see the green right there. And so you fix the leak, right? The problem is not the herniation. The problem is the leak. And we're packing in some fat, put on a little glue, and that, and that seals nicely. Again, a very, very different operation than a Chiari operation. It gets, it gets misdiagnosed all the time. And these are really, really complicated patients where you don't want to go wrong. So this has sort of been a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everything here. A little bit of background on Chiari, a little bit on the anatomy, and then some time spent on thinking about Chiari as not one syndrome, but really six or eight or ten different things that all seem similar. And we, as physicians who are interested in this disease and this etiology, need to be mindful that this is not simply one thing and that there is not one-size-fits-all surgery. Um, because when we evaluate these patients um, and we offer them the surgery that we know how to do best, then we're doing them a disservice and can often cause more problems. So the evaluation has to be standardized for these different types of problems, and the treatment has to be standardized. And they're all very, very different. So this isn't one disease. It's a complex constellation of different pathologies, right? You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Chiari syndrome. You can call it cervical medullary compression syndrome. You can call it tonsillar herniation. It doesn't really matter what you call it. You have to recognize that it's not all the same thing that everyone in this room has. They all may present with similar symptoms, but they're all different things. Symptoms have to be put in front of the measurements. We can get so worked up as physicians worried about what the degree of herniation is. You can be so worried about what the angle is. The symptoms are what drive successful surgery. If you focus on that, then the likelihood of having a successful outcome are going to be much higher. You really have to consider all the associated disorders that go along with Chiari, like I talked about, and figure out where on that spectrum each of you falls. The treatment has to be individualized. Each one of you has a unique circumstance of pathology, radiology, and symptomatology that has to be merged into a treatment plan. And you have to seek out expertise and be an advocate for yourself. Don't take the first answer that you hear. Don't take my answer. Go and search. Talk to other patients. Get opinions. This is a disease that requires lots of thought, lots of collaboration. Um, and sometimes people see things differently when they look at it for a second time. I might see something differently on a scan that I didn't see the first time. Right? We're all learning here. Um, but if you take the time and you find people who are educated in this and who are compassionate and take the time to think about it, you're more likely to have a good result. But there's no cure out there for this. This is about figuring out a way to minimize your symptoms, create a better quality of life, um, and live the life that you want, understanding that there's um, a certain level of inherent disability that may come along with what's a congenital etiology with years and years of compression behind it. So seek us out, find us. The CSF is a great resource. They have experts from all over the country, all over the region. Uh, and we know all of, our, uh, all of each other, and we talk, uh, and we're willing to share information in that way. So last poll question, if you haven't logged off here. This is an important one, because I think um, we want to make this format that CSF has allowed us to um, do with you here. We want to make this for you, and we want you to figure out what you want us to talk about. right? So in the first half of the lecture, I, I gave you like a dozen different things that I think could be interesting topics here. Classification, syringomyelia, basilar invagination, pseudotumor, EDS, any of these things that you think might be interested, let us know. And you don't necessarily have to do this here. You can send us an email. You can let me know. You can let Jordan know. Um, and as we form the, the seminar series, we'll take into account what you guys are interested in hearing and hopefully provide experts for you that are informative and, and help guide your decision making as you sort of go down this path and, and are on this journey. So with that, um, certainly it's late. It's 8 o'clock. I think we finished right on time. That's pretty amazing. If you feel like you need to get out of here, go home and get, tuck your kids in, get some dinner, please do. If you feel like you want to stick around and answer questions, I'll stay as long as anybody wants uh, and answer any questions you may have from all of this. So 
Thank you so much for coming. that you will be uploading uh, some of the videos online. Will you be able to share the whole presentation? Sure, absolutely. I think the presentation is going to be automatically uploaded to the CSF website. If you go to CSF and like educational videos, they have literally 50 videos that you can spend hours looking at, and I think this will probably be up there in a matter of days, is my guess. Um, and that usually turns just around three days. So. In terms of the videos themselves, we'll, we'll provide a link from our website on the QRI website, and we're going to cut those down a little bit and, and, and maybe do a little fine tuning to make them a little bit more. Um, concise, but yeah, you can find them at, at our website and um, we'll provide those links for you. Thanks. And just one more question. Uh, you showed us examples of surgeries that you did that were successful. You were able to see it on the MRI, but the symptoms were still there. So then what? I mean, you already did what you could have done for the surgery, but the symptoms are there. So in that case, what's next? Yeah, that's, that, that's the, the difficult slide in terms of do you wait? Do you give it more time? Depends on how old the patient is. Depends on how long they've had the symptoms. It's a 50 year old with a syrinx and their symptoms haven't resolved despite the syrinx going away. I'm never gonna recommend more surgery for that patient because that's just the natural history of the disease. They've had dysfunction. If it's a seven year old and they still have a syrinx and they have new symptoms, I'm much more likely to be more aggressive and try and find a solution for that based on their life ahead of them and the response that they might have to intervention. So I don't want to be too generalized, but it's really patient specific. Um, sometimes we'll do evaluations for connective tissue problems, look for problems with ICP. Maybe there's instability that was formed. And so we're pretty um, you know, aggressive about looking for other things that we've missed. And we try not to turn any, not to leave any stone unturned, but at the same time, you know, I think patience um, and caution is warranted when there's been a failed surgery because we just know the numbers suggest that the likelihood of a successful outcome after a failed one is lower. So when there's something obvious, we'll go after it, but I think, you know, we have to have a really good plan when you do that. I saw a hand. Yeah. Over there? Yeah. Um, in which position? I'm sorry, my English. In which position is better to sleep? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it was. Uh, it is difficult to sleep at night for me, and and the whole night I'm waking up. That's yeah. Right. Well, I mean, the answer is the answer is going to be what works for you, right? I mean, there's certainly a good reason why it may be difficult for you to sleep in certain positions, right? I, I showed you examples where by flexing the neck or extending the neck, you create more strain or less strain on those structures. So people will find the right position. It's usually a neutral position on the side that works for most people, but there's no single way to think about it. Um, you know, patients who are having problems with sleep, you know, I often will advocate for a sleep study to see if there's some disordered sleep mechanics going on, either essential or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but I think it's a little bit of trial and error and a little bit of caution about making sure the brainstem is not dysfunctional. But you're not alone on that, for sure. I think most people in this room would say they've got uh, disordered sleep. It's really, really common. Uh, in this position, maybe um, depression or to the depression will be less. In, in a certain position, correct. You're, you're going to find, but I think it's just the same position that you'll find when you're awake. I mean, people will find a position that works for them. You know, being in a cervical collar sometimes works for people because it eliminates the motion of their spine. They find that they're comfortable. Um, it's the same thing with sleep. Find the position you're comfortable, and that's probably where your brainstem is going to be under the least amount of stress. There's one more question, or? So, uh, just um, on the screen, the uh, entry into the dura always looked so random and asymmetrical. I was just wondering uh -huh. why the why the edges were just look like kind of randomly cut. Um, it's not that random. It's pretty precise. I think what you probably are witnessing is that the, the dura can sometimes be extremely vascular, um, especially in younger children. And so we actually have to coagulate and burn the edges of the dura back so it doesn't bleed. And that creates some irregularity there. That might be what you're seeing, particularly in younger kids. Um, and so it's usually open as a very nice straight line. And then once you're done stopping the bleeding and coagulating the edges, it comes a little bit more ragged. That's probably what you witness there, but it's, it's not random. Um, is there a genetic component at all? Curie, if one member of the family has it, is it more likely than another family is going to have it as well? 
That's a great, great question, and there are some really smart people studying this. The likelihood of an affected sibling um, is definitely higher in someone who has Chiari, so if one child has it, the other one is more likely than just the general population. Um, there are definitely families in which Chiari runs. That being said, the vast majority of Chiaris are sporadic, meaning that they come without a familial predisposition. It's not like there are lots of families, but they, are, they do exist. Um, there are lots of centers of excellence. Duke is sort of known for this. They're studying thousands of patients and looking at the genetics and trying to establish what type of signals. These are typically thought to be growth factors and um, signals that direct the formation of the mesoderm, the bony and cartilaginous elements during embryology that go awry, trying to figure out where that goes wrong. The likelihood on that research leading to something that affects a cure or a change is I think exceedingly low, despite my optimism and my you know, admiration for what they're doing, I think this is a structural problem that's usually identified in adults. And so while identifying the embryology is, is interesting and I think important to help understand it right now, I think it's a structural problem that's still fixed with a structural answer. So I think it may not yield a lot of help for patients today, but who knows where genetics will end up in 10 or 15 years, probably ways that we don't even understand today. You said there's a link between siblings. What about between parent and child? Yeah, no, it's it's increased. So there's a, there's a more, an increase. I mean, the follow-up question to that, which I'm sure you're. You, you want to know the answer to, or have maybe asked me before, is you know should you screen a child, right? And so people always want to know if if I have Chiari, should, should I, sc yeah, should I screen my child? And so it comes down to two questions: one, are they symptomatic, right? So an asymptomatic child, I would not screen because I think you have to be prepared to deal with the answer that you receive on the MRI scan. And my answer would be an asymptomatic child would never have surgery. So do you want to know? Is that going to make you more anxious, more nervous? I don't know. That's a, that's a personal decision. If they're having symptoms, that might be a separate question. So if you have Chiari and your child has symptoms that you have, it might be real. It might be that they're aware that you have those symptoms and they're you know talking about them you know for other reasons, behavioral reasons, or attention getting reasons, or it might be real. And so there are definitely families that um, parents and, and children have Chiari, but it's rare. How prevalent the sympathy would you think would suggest like screening for something like that? The simple neck pain, or does that have to be like multiple set of symptoms? Yeah. I mean, it depends what the context is. I mean, you know, daily incapacitating neck pain that, you know, results in visits to the nurse's office, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Occasional neck pain after playing soccer on the weekend, obviously not. So you can definitely talk about it if you're concerned. I'm happy to look at it. If you don't have a syrinx now, can you develop it later on? Really good question. The answer is yes, you can develop syrinx. It's not that common. Um, the natural history is something that, again, some of these groups in the Midwest, you know, in um, St. Louis and in Michigan, have done phenomenal work on looking at huge populations. You can get a syrinx after not having one. You can also have syrinx resolve after having had one. Um, amazing, amazing pictures and, and vignettes of stories where patients have had. Chiari and syrinx has been planned for surgery and have had repeat MRIs done before surgery and the syrinx have resolved. So all these different things come into play. They're all less likely. For the most part, I tell patients that if they've got a syrinx, it's not going to go away. It's probably not going to increase dramatically. It might change subtly over many years. Um, and similarly, if you don't have a syrinx at presentation, it's not likely that you're going to develop one, although um, certainly that's more likely than the other way around. And lastly, uh, you mentioned there will be other centers in the future. Um, if you want to be aware of that, is there somewhere that we can sign up so that we know as soon as you know, it comes up? Great question. Can they sign up to get announcements about upcoming talks and lectures and events? Yes. You can go to uh, csfinfo.org. And, and if I can just, like the infomercial, we're doing a walk. So they should they should email csfinfo.org and just let them know that you want to be on a mailing list and then you'll if you aren't already. If you aren't already. So if they signed up for today, are they gonna be registered? If you registered for today we have your email. by yourself, then you're on your email address is on the list. Perfect. So on you guys will keep it for any future information? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You mentioned um, we have a pseudo tumor. Yes. What test would that show up on? A, a MRI or a 
of the testing you came up with? So pseudotumor is a, is a clinical diagnosis first, so symptomatology of increased pressure in the head. We typically diagnose it first on an ophthalmologic examination. You can actually see pressure at the back of the eye with a dilated exam because the CSF spaces between the brain and the eye are connected, so we can actually see those. Sometimes um, it's actually directly measured through something called a lumbar puncture. Sometimes it's measured directly through a pressure monitor, an actual bolt that's screwed into the skull that measures pressure for 24 hours. So there's a number of ways to do it, and the etiology, the cause of it, can then further be investigated via those MRVs that I was showing, those really pretty venograms where we look for constriction in the outflow vessels. You mentioned there was a specific neurosurgeon for that? For the stenting? Yeah. So that would, you know, so if you were, if you thought there was someone that you knew who had that, it would, you know, it would still come through Chiari Care, come through one of us, and then if we'd found on that MRV that there was a stenosis, then we would refer you over to that person. One last, last one. You talked about EDS and the fact that you would need to factor that into a treatment plan. Yes. That can't be the last question, that's too long. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yet there is really no test for EDS. Right. So how do you approach it and what do you do differently if you know the person has EDS? Yes, so th again, that, that might be a topic for a whole nother lecture series. I'll say very briefly, just to sort of you know outline it, that um, Part of it is patients' awareness of the disease and whether or not they actually have symptoms that might suggest they have a connective tissue disorder. Um, we do a very rudimentary screening for it, um, you know, but there's not a lot you can do to be definitive. If there's clinical concern for it, um, we always will investigate it further if there's a concern for instability in the spine, for example. If there's a patient who has a simple Chiari and they're getting teed up for regular surgery and their spine otherwise looks fine, we don't necessarily say you need to go to a geneticist, you need to do all this fancy stuff. Again, individualizing the treatment plan. If you've got instability in the spine, we think you've got autonomic dysfunction, we think that you've got a, a reason to suggest that your ligaments are not proper, then those are the patients that I would insist go to a geneticist, get a definitive diagnosis because then we have to be more careful about the surgery. We have to consider a fusion. We want to think about how we handle the tissues. We might want to get a plastic surgeon involved to do the closure. So there's lots of different nuances at different levels that we might change based upon our inclination that that predisposition exists, um, but it's often very, very challenging to be sure about it. Does it usually have a positive outcome, though, even with EDS? So if you don't take those things into account, you're almost guaranteed to have a bad outcome. If you do take them into account, the results are not as good, but you're likely to do well, but not as well as your comparative cohort of patients who, doesn't have a con who don't have a connective tissue disorder. So it does make it trickier, for sure. So if I had a patient like that, is this a child or an adult? An adult. Um, I think that there's two ways to think about this. One is great that you're aware of these things that are going on, right? Is it possible that doing a simple decompression will be effective at alleviating those symptoms? It is possible, right? So um, you need to make sure that there's not some underlying problem though, right? So is there instability or EDS or autonomic dysfunction that's causing this or is it just simple QRI pressure that's causing these things? If you're aware, and I think a lot of what this comes down to is just being aware and being you know, informed about what the possible outcomes are. If you're aware that, well, we're going to do the simpler operation because there's a good chance it's going to work, but if it doesn't work, this is what might happen, then I think patients will be okay. If you go in with the idea we're going to fix you with this and then you get worse, that's where the disconnect happens and you get a wedge driven between patient and doctor. So it's just about being informed and being aware of what the different possible outcomes are. And I think then at least you're informed and you know there's a possibility that something else might be done. But, you know, in those situations, you do very patient specific testing. You might want to get a Holter monitor and test and see what's really going on. You might want to see a dysautonomia specialist and have a little bit more information. So you go in with your eyes open knowing even if you decide to do it simple, at least you have the information in front of you and you can make that decision in an informed fashion. 
All right, let's break it here, and if anyone wants to talk to me, they can. Thank you so much for coming, and hope to see you again at our future seminars.